Hey, good morning, guys. Pastor Josh Duffy here with you. Such a pleasure to be with you as we continue the march into our presidential series. Uh, this is an exciting candidate today. This is uh, the Mount Rushmore of candidates. Uh, some good, bad, and ugly. Let's just kind of cover that real quick. Uh, he did not pick necessarily the best VP candidate. Actually, when he needed his second in command the most, uh, he went and threw a frat party, okay, on steroids. So didn't, didn't exactly pick the best inner circle. Uh, he would lose his cool from time to time and break things. Uh, so there's that. Uh, he never saw true prosperity, like led in a time of prosperity. Um, definitely conflict. Um, got a taste of prosperity for his people and in his leadership. Um, knew it was coming, but never actually got to experience it. Um, relatively healthy nation, though. Uh, for you, if, if, if you're thinking, man, I want a leader that keeps a nation in shape. Uh, he led the first nationwide 40-year-long uh, walkathon. Okay, so uh, cardio-wise, stellar. All right. Um, also, uh, was old. Uh, actually, older than both our President Trump and Joe Biden. Uh, he was older than both of them uh, during his leadership, uh, but he also had a mean sleeper hold. Oh, there was this one thing about him. Uh, he did kill a guy with his bare hands. So if that's an issue for you, murder in a presidential candidate, this may not be your guy. But nevertheless, uh, scripture uh, reveres him as a great, great leader. He's none other than Moses. Now, let me just say, this is what's interesting in the story, in the life and times and leadership of Moses. Uh, as you recall, when we looked at Abraham as a candidate, uh, the story of Abraham and Sarah. Remember, uh, Sarah lost her nerve in trust of God's plan for her to provide a son. Abraham went MIA and became a very passive, quiet, do nothing, say nothing male, and just kind of went along with whatever his wife wanted, which then brought Hagar into the story, the servant or slave girl of Sarah. Um, and Hagar, scripture points out that Hagar was Egyptian. This is super bizarre, right? Because they would have a child, Hagar and Abraham, named Ishmael, which we talked about would become the line and lineage of present day Islam. Uh, and then you have Hagar being Egyptian, and this whole thing flips because now this, the, like, the person that was the slave girl, now the lineage of her in the next story, they are the power players. And now the lineage of Abraham and Sarah, now they're the slaves. That's where this story picks up. We just looked at last week, epic moment with Joseph, right? Leadership, and, and, and the nation grows, the family grows. They move and eat off of the fat of the land, and they're loved and revered by the Egyptians. Well, finally, there's a leader in Egypt that could care less who Joseph ever was, what he ever did. We have a problem. There's too many of these people. Let's put them to work. Let's not pay them, uh, and uh, let's get the most out of these people, and they are crying out to God uh, for generations that he would uh, hear their cries and intercede in a mighty way. And so we're going to take a look at how this happens um, because now generationally it has now come almost kind of full circle. You may have that happen in your life, that there's some kind of a, a struggle or something that's happened two generations. And now whatever that issue is has a weird way of revisiting that is the enemy. That is what the enemy does, is keeps coming back. This life is struggle. This life is conflict. And who we can put our hope and our trust in is Jesus and Jesus alone. The enemy will not stop. It'll keep coming back, okay? It'll keep resurfacing. You know, you may not realize this, but even in the last hundred years, this idea, it's not just here in this biblical story of how another generation can come back and now you have a whole new problem. It's happened even in American history. Uh, I can give you one such example. Um, a major kind of henchman, uh, um, trusted general of Adolf Hitler, his name was Otto uh, Scorzini. Otto was Hitler's go-to guy, okay? If I need an operation done, 
Okay, if I need to rescue Mussolini and pull him out of Italy in the 11th hour, okay, if I need to pull off other, some other kind of dangerous operation, Otto was his guy. At the tail end of World War II, he's given the directive to find a way to wage a new kind of war after the end of the war. Destabilize governments in Europe that are trying to get their footing again after World War II. All right, this kind of guerrilla warfare. Otto even had a group of individuals, um, a secret group of soldiers that he was training to be suicide bombers. You heard that right. Otto, in his training and his leadership, he would then form alliances in the Middle East that would last between the 40s and the 1960s until his death in the 70s. Never brought to justice for everything that he was a part of during World War II. Some of the people that would learn and be influenced by him were Saddam Hussein, the likes of which, another name, Gaddafi, maybe you recognize that. Another person who was also influenced by him uh, was named Bin Laden, the father of modern day terrorism, goes all the way back to Nazi Germany, see? And you think that you defeated the enemy in the 1940s, and yet here you have 60 years later, no, it's just come back at, at you in a new form. And that's what you're going to see biblically what happens. That's what you're going to see in your own life, in your own family, is that we are in this struggle, and Jesus and Jesus alone is our hope, our Savior, our path, um, our defender, and our friend, because in this life, this is what you're going to keep seeing, okay? So here it is, the story with uh, Moses fascinating. Okay, here's some high points. Check it out. Um, Moses' <clears throat> mother actually sets him free, sets him loose. It's just a little baby in the Nile for his own protection and for his own good. Here's what happens when mom does this for the protection of her little baby boy. Exodus chapter 2 verses 5 to 6. Then Pharaoh's daughter went down to the Nile to bathe and her attendants were walking along the riverbank. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her female slave to get it. She opened it and saw the baby. He was crying, and she felt sorry for him. This is one of the Hebrew babies, she said. This is Pharaoh's daughter, finds Moses, and goes back to dad. Pharaoh goes, can I keep him? Can I keep him? Right? And he's like, fine, whatever, you know? And then meanwhile, of all people, this is just the providence and the beauty of God's story. It's actually Moses' actual mother who's brought in to help raise the child, right? This story picks up that even as Moses would grow, now he's in the, the court of Pharaoh, okay? He's now being trained of, as a prince. He now has the rank of prince, finest education, finest um, resources, highest level of resources and authority at his disposal. He would have gotten an upper tier education. He would be equipped in strategy, in, in economics, in leadership, in warfare. I mean, he would have the best of the best that he would have gotten. He's now 40 years of age. He's a man, all right? He's been brought up, but you can bet even during his formation and his formative years, mom is reminding him of his identity. See, his identity is not skin deep. His identity is not the clothes that he wore, the colors and the royalty of Egypt. No, his identity was much deeper. And mom would keep speaking that to him. The people that are suffering out there, they are your people, Moses. Do not forget who you are. Do not forget whose you are, see? And this story picks up <clears throat> Exodus chapter 2, verses 11 to 12. One day after Moses had grown up, he went out to where his own people were and watched them at their hard labor. He saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his own people, Looking this way and that, seeing no one, he killed the Egyptian and, had, and hid him in the sand. And here's what's interesting. Here he makes this move. And you need to know this about Scripture. At no point, Scripture is describing something that Moses did. Scripture does not condone what Moses did. And I know we get all that kind of twisted right now, like maybe he was justified in what he did. Actually, Scripture never signs off on the decision of Moses to take this man's life. No matter his position, 
no matter what was happening, doesn't give him the green light, okay? That's what's fascinating, just recounts. That's it. Remember, God at this point is working with broken pieces to enact a perfect plan. Broken people, sinful people making sinful decisions. Make no mistake, he killed a man. He sinned. God is going to work through Moses' sin and his brokenness. God will work through you and even your sinful state, your broken state, your broken past to do something powerful because he's that faithful. He's more faithful than your brokenness. His promise is more perfect than the pieces and the mess that may be your past or your life. No different than Moses. And so here's what's so, so interesting is it says here in verses 13 and 14, the next day he went out and saw two Hebrews fighting. He asked the one in the wrong, why are you hitting your fellow Hebrew? The man said, who made you ruler and judge over us? Are you thinking of killing me as you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid and thought, what I did must have become known. How odd. Moses receives no appreciation, no respect, even from the people who are oppressed. This is their way of, you know, like, who are you, dude? You're, you're the guy that killed the people in power. Like, there's like no, he, here he's earned no points and no respect whatsoever for what he did. In fact, he just gets shut down, and at that point he realizes, man, this isn't good. I don't have an ally anywhere. I have been found out, people know, and he goes on the run. Pharaoh now is after Moses. Moses goes all the way down to Midian, Scripture tells us, starts a family, moves on with his life. It's been 40 years. He's now 80 years of age where our story picks up. 80, okay? He's lived a whole additional 40 years of life. A whole lifetime ago was he in Pharaoh's court. God's timing is hilarious. For Moses, I have to believe, just when he finally reached a point when he he no longer thought he was of use to God, just when maybe he thought everything that he had planned was finally dead, that is the moment (laughs) when God would use him, when he had reached a place of contentment and settled in peace, God would call him into the next thing. God's timing is not contingent on our timetables. God's plan and his timing is perfect. See, Moses wanted to take action at age 40, and it backfired horribly. God had a plan, and that plan was to take action when Moses was 80. Timing, perfect. Plan, perfect perfect purpose perfect so the story picks up in exodus chapter 3 now moses was tending the flock of jethro his father-in-law the priest of midian and he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to horeb the mountain of god there the angel of the lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush moses saw that though the bush was on fire it did not burn up so moses thought i will go over and see this strange sight why the bush does not burn up When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses, and Moses said, here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now, go, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you, 
and this will be the sign to you that this that it is I who have sent you when you have brought the people out of Egypt you will worship God on this mountain the angel of the Lord that showed up very similar to some of our previous stories that we've already talked about this is no normal angel this is Malik Yahweh different than a normal angel this is the messenger of Yahweh this is the demarcation this is the notation of an angel in fact that is the second person of the Trinity it is the pre-incarnate Jesus Christ the second person of the Trinity speaking to Moses that's going to be really important later not just an angel it is the second person of the Trinity speaking to Moses I have heard the cries of these people don't think that Jesus doesn't hear the cry of his people the suffering of his people don't you think that God's heart does not break for what is broken in this life he hears it and he sees it it's so interesting because by the time Moses after much you know weeping and gnashing of teeth <laughs> he didn't even want to go and God made it really clear I don't care how ill-equipped you think you are I got you okay you're equipped because I'm going to show up and that's what's going to matter. And at this point, there's a, an exchange and Pharaoh's heart is hardened. Moses has now approached Pharaoh and made it really clear, let my people go. Pharaoh has no intention of doing that. At that point, um, God does something profound. He begins to go to the very root of Egyptian culture and begins to dismantle it in the form of 10 plagues. And the first one was just like a pre-plague, okay? Moses' staff turns into a snake and eats a, a, one of the cobras that they had. And a cobra was supposed to be the god or the sign or the symbol of, of protection of Pharaoh. That's the cobra's job. That's what they believed and trusted in. They had this whole series in, in, of, of gods that they would trust in throughout their nature and their culture and in their understanding. But it was actually the very core of their security, the very core of their purpose, their identity, their worth, who they would put their trust and their hope in, were all of these little gods. The root of who they are is ultimately who God was now going to go after. Pick it apart, one piece at a time in the form of 10 plagues. And so here it is, right? If you think that you were going to find life from the Nile, they had a number of gods tied to the Nile, right? It was the life-giving waters, well, then God turns it into blood to show them that the gods that they trusted that resembled and were a part of the Nile that they would worship, in fact, now was nothing more than dead, no longer life-giving. If you, in fact, saw frogs, which they did, they worshipped as though it was fertility and fertility gods related to the frog. Well, now instead of um, having a life that would look like there would be multiple generations in life, right? All of a sudden, they were going to have so many frogs, it was going to be a disgusting mess, and they'd be piled as high as you can imagine, just death upon death. Suddenly, something that they would celebrate was becoming disgusting and dead. The God that they would associate with the frog, the God that they would associate with fertility that gives life, God would now make them think of it and see it and smell it and realize it's nothing more than death. That God is weak, a fake, a phony. It is not the real God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Then, of course, they worshiped the, ner the earth, and there were gods associated with the earth. They could, they could put their foot down on the ground and trust that it was going to be firm footing because the gods that they associated with the earth were going to take care of them. That was until the gnats that rose up out of the dust suddenly played a head game psychologically on them. We can't even trust the ground that we walk upon. See, the gods associated with the ground were impotent and weak, fake and phony when compared to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. See, they loved flies. They saw the fly as tenacity and courage, but that was right up into the point when all of a sudden the flies that God sent were now biting and attacking them. Psychological warfare, see. The gods that you think that you revere, they will turn on you because they are weak. They're turncoats. They're treasonous fake and phony. The gods that you associate with all the animals that graze on the fields, pestilence would wage war on the land and all of a sudden it would just be carcass after carcass, the rotten stench of death. What you associated with all of the animals that you would worship are now all dead and gone. You put all of your faith and your trust 
in medicine, the gods that you associated with medicine to keep you healthy and safe. Does this sound familiar, America, right? And you're going to put all of your hope and your faith in that right until God sends boils to cover the very surface and the skin of each and every person. They're so uncomfortable, they're hurting, they're in pain, and none of their gods that are supposed to be the ones that they appeal to for their, for their hope of their bodies and their health and their well-being suddenly now were proven to be false and fake and phony. What about the God of your livelihood, right? Your 401k, your crops that are growing all around you, the God that they would trust in for their crops to protect the sky and the rains and to look out from them from above was something that they could trust in surely, but that was right up to the point that God would rain down hail and prove that not even the gods in the sky above could protect from such damage that would rain down from the heavens. And in case they had any kind of anything still growing, then God sent locusts to finish the job, blot out almost the sun of the number of wave and wave and wave of locusts that would inhabit their region, inhabit their earth, but at least they could trust in Ra, right? The great sun god, the creator god, Ra. And then God would blot it out of the sky. It would shine no more. Ra is weak. Ra is fake. Ra is phony. Well, at least they could trust in Pharaoh. Pharaoh was believed to be a god. And gods have a son, Pharaoh's firstborn son. Certainly their god, Pharaoh, and Pharaoh's firstborn son, they could trust right up until the point that Pharaoh himself is seen as weak, fake, and phony because he can't even protect his own son. There's wailing and crying that goes out in Egypt as the angel of death passes over and the firstborn throughout Egypt lose their life, including the son of Pharaoh. And it's during this meal that they have Passover, the very first Passover. A Passover that they would have standing up because they had to be ready to leave. And it would be God associating taste and smell with an experience that would be passed on to every single generation of how God attacked the root, the core being of who these people are. See, this is what we're missing in America, what would be the 10 little gods that God would destroy here in this country that we put our faith and our hope in and our security in, our meaning and our purpose in, in this life? From it being our resources, our job, our career, our health, our family, our communities, our country, all of these little things that we lift up, how many of them would God slay if we really just step back for a second and he repeated these kinds of plagues upon the world? How many of us would be exposed in that moment for having all these little tiny gods that we put our faith, our trust, our hope, and our identity in? See, here's the thing. What America likes to deal with right now is the fruit, not the root. We like to deal with the fruit, 30,000 feet, but not the root. All of the discussions, the arguments, the fighting, the protesting, the death toll that's happening now it's all about fruit. Let me tell you something. Two people meet on a street, and you can make these two people anything you want, okay? I don't, wherever you land on any of these issues, if you're hearing my voice right now, whether it's a, an officer, okay, and somebody that, that is pulled over or what have you, whether it's just two people in a city or in a town or in the suburbs, any two individuals, okay, they at that point, by the time they meet, it's too late. You got what you got. You got 20 or 30 years or 40 or 50 years of life experience formation that informs the decisions that they're going to make in that moment. The fruit of all of those experiences and what is in them, within them, is going to inform who they believe that they think they are, is going to inform their decisions in that moment. We love that. You know who else loves the fruit? Satan. Remember Adam? He loves dealing with this. Because see, you can just keep rolling this over from generation to generation. You can put whatever kind of sign and symbol on it that you want. 
And as long as you can stay up here and not get into the root, man, Satan loves that. It gives him enough room to maneuver to keep these kinds of interactions toxic and toxic and toxic, never to stop. God gives Moses really clear instruction. If you want to turn around the next generation, your marriage, your family, and your faith, marriage, family, faith, I do not care, okay? If you, whatever you're thinking of in your political beliefs, these three things are the cornerstone of healthy cultures. We are running around asking God to bless things that he did not ordain, he did not design, were not his will, and then we're surprised that by the time these two people meet, it goes south. What do you expect? The root, our families, marriages, our faith. It's so, so important. It is how God instructs Moses to hit the reset button, to give these people a new mind and a new heart and new eyes and new ears to interact in the world. So, so important. And it's so interesting that when Jesus would show up, you know, Jesus would ride into town. We call it Palm Sunday. And what everyone is thinking is that finally the next Moses is here. We're going to finally be delivered. The next Moses is here. Our ancestors were delivered out from underneath the tyranny of Egypt. And the new Moses is here. And he's going to lead us as a warrior like David. He's going to pull us out from underneath the tyranny of Rome. And they celebrated Jesus when he came riding into town. Those that were the influential leaders in the political realm or in the religious realm saw the threat that was actually riding into town on a donkey. They knew that Jesus was going to tip the scales in a way that they could not afford. He was going to turn upside down the entire social order. They couldn't have it. And by the time you get to Passover, the meal where Jesus and his disciples are celebrating and remembering as the people would, God's faithfulness to pull them out of slavery. See, even the people, the generations of children of Israel, what were the Jews now at that point? They even missed that God was going after the root. And all they wanted was political solutions. All they wanted was God to pull them and move them from one place to another, completely missing that now what God wanted to do was not move them from one location to another, but to move in them. They couldn't see it. And it is during Passover that Jesus would begin to let the disciples feel the full weight. This meal that would remind them of God's faithfulness to pull out previous, a previous generation out from under slavery Jesus would now help them understand that this meal would now be reinterpreted within himself. And the applications of it would now extend to all nations and all people who would love and trust and come to know Jesus as Savior and Lord. To help them understand that the real tyranny is out from under sin, death, and Satan. That this meal now would become real for each and every believer. That when they would take and eat the bread... They would remember the tyranny of slavery, of sin, Satan, and death. That now they would be given a new freedom and a new name and a new identity and they'd be pulled out of that mess. Your past, your baggage, never to define you again. And the same promises would then apply to you that Jesus would come back one day and take you to be his own for all eternity. That's what happens that night. The greater Moses gives them the greater plan and a greater sense of freedom that would be available to them. But as you know, that night, that wasn't going to work. Social justice reigns supreme. Justice is getting what you deserve. And to the religious leaders and to the political leaders, what Jesus deserved and to the average person was to die between two criminals. That's justice. He's a fake. He's a phony. He's threatening our way of life and our world order. Social justice 
bloodshed. They thought all is now equal. And in fact, the very wrath of God in that moment would be quenched because Jesus would become the person who would take the place of the justice that was due me and was due you and due all creation in the moment when he died on the cross. But see, Jesus, when he died on the cross, that kind of death went right to the root of our problem. Jesus moved social justice into social forgiveness. And three days later, Jesus would stand victorious, alive, and giving life to each and every one of us over sin, death, and Satan. Jesus, the greater Moses, giving us his grace, his love, and his mercy, taking all the air, all of the movement away from Satan. Nothing destroys Satan quite like forgiveness, grace, love, and mercy. And that's exactly what Jesus gave us. Jesus, the greater Moses. So my question is for you, would you vote for Moses? Let's pray. God, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for your power. We thank you for your mercy and your love. We thank you, God, that you pull us out of the mess that is our lives. We are not defined by the tyranny of our sin and our failures. We thank you, God, that you're all about freedom. We thank you, God, that for all the things that have been done to one another and been done to each other, that you made right, you made right each and every one of us before you, counted as sons and daughters of a holy and righteous God, counted as your brothers and your sisters because of what you did for us. Thank you for being the greater Moses. Thank you for the freedom that you've granted us that will last for all eternity. It's in your name, Jesus, that we pray. Amen. Amen.